Well hello everybody, it's Dan, your friendly fishmonger from DansFish.com. I've received a lot of requests from folks lately to talk about how uh, to, how do I quarantine fish, how do I take care of newly arrived, newly imported fish, all that stuff. For several weeks now I've got several requests, I got more this week, and so I have a fairly decent sized shipment coming in on Monday, today's Friday. And so I'm about to start prepping my quarantine system for them and everything. So I thought what I would do is take advantage of the timing and go ahead and, and make this video for you. So today I'm going to show you what I do to kind of prep the aquariums before the fish arrive. Then I'll show you when the fish arrive and I'll take you through the process. It's, it's basically a week long with, with meds more or less and then another week in tanks just with observation so it's going to take a couple weeks to complete this video but i hope by the time you see it they'll have captured the majority of the details of how it's done to help folks that are, are asking all these questions so with that let me show you the quarantine system okay so here's the quarantine system behind me let's show you in detail it's all these tanks over here. They're 30 gallon breeders. They're bare tanks. And all they have is an air stone. There's no biological filtration going on in here because the medicines I use will kill off biological filtration, <laughs> kill off nitrifying bacteria. So these are pretty much just bare tanks with some air circulation. Now, I haven't cleaned them out yet. So from last round, there's some algae growing and stuff. So today what I'm gonna do is show you how I clean these out and sterilize them in preparation for the next batch of fish to come in. I just finished catching all the fish that were in here out and putting them in their more permanent homes. And so now I'm gonna be sterilizing them. And this is what I use. I use hydrogen peroxide. It's super inexpensive. I buy it at Walmart. This is 88 cents in half a bottle treats a 30 gallon aquarium. So basically what I'm going to do is go around to all these aquariums and um, put in some hydrogen peroxide. By the way, here's my cheater. This is just a little plastic container that I've measured four cups into. One, two, three, four cups to help me kind of distribute the hydrogen peroxide. Get ready, because I'm sure we're going to do an awesome time lapse right here. All right, here we go. All right, so here we are, getting the hydrogen peroxide in the tanks. Nothing really fancy about this, just measure it out, pour it in, pretty simple stuff. And um, yeah, it's really effective at sterilizing the tanks and getting everything ready. Now I guess technically, since that was on video, I should have worn like safety glasses, like Bill Nye the Science Guy, right? Um, because this stuff can splash and all that. I, I have it on my hands a little bit, so I'm gonna go wash my hands really well right now. What I'm gonna do is basically I'm gonna let this stuff sit in these tanks for a couple hours. And it's just going to disinfect everything in these tanks. If there's any bacteria in here left over from the previous batch of fish, it'll take care of that. And that will, um, make it so that <laughs> it's nice and clean and ready for the next batch. So that's where we're at in a couple hours. Uh, I'll show you what I do. Basically I'll come back and, and do the next step. So see you in a bit. And by the way, don't wear nice clothes when you do this. Uh, I actually have a t-shirt on that I kind of like right now. Probably not the best idea to be wearing that when you're using hydrogen peroxide because it'll eat through your clothing just like bleach would. So be careful about that. All right. So the disinfectant that we're probably most familiar with, you know, in, around the house and in our aquariums is bleach. And people ask me sometimes, why do you use hydrogen peroxide instead of bleach? And the reason is because it doesn't smell. Bleach smells up the whole fish room. It just stinks. It hurts your nose. You know, you walk in a room that's had a lot of bleach, you can feel the burn in your nose. That can't be good, right? Getting that in your lungs. So that's, that's reason number one. Reason number two is when hydrogen peroxide is done, it's process, when it's oxidized, everything is gonna oxidize, which is how it kills off bacteria and things. Um, it's waste products are just water and oxygen, O2 and H2O. 
So it's not like chlorine where you, you treat with the bleach, the chlorine bleach, and then um, you have to then dechlorinate it and, and put a bunch of carbon in there to suck out any extra chlorine or anything like that. Because the waste products of hydrogen peroxide are just O2 and water, which is great for an aquarium. So that's why I do that. Anyway, uh, just thought I'd throw that reason into the video before, uh, before these tanks sat and before I forgot. So a couple hours and we'll be back. All right, so it's been a couple of hours. Um, I've changed my clothes. I got on some old stained clothes so that uh, I wouldn't have to worry about getting any peroxide on them. I, I normally wear like trashy clothes when I do this stuff, but the first part of the video I was like, well, I'm making a video, maybe I'll dress nicer. And then I was like, nah, it's not worth it. So I'm back in my grimy clothes because I don't want to ruin my, uh, I love that t-shirt. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to scrub these down. So. If you look here, see all this mold that's kind of accumulated in the bottom of these aquariums? That happens even if you don't feed um, in these tanks, just because, you know, stuff happens. There might be some residual uh, food matter in the fish's gut that they expel, or some algae starts to grow or something, and then you put in the hydrogen peroxide and it kind of eats it away and it falls to the bottom. So I don't want any of that in these aquariums because it's, I don't want any uh, like biological matter in these aquariums besides the fish because anything that's in there, any bioactive or uh, you know material that can rot will rot and then I'll get ammonia in there. And since I have no filtration going in these aquariums that I use for uh, medicating fish when they first get in. I want to get all the biological mass out of there that I can. So I'm going to siphon up all that stuff off the bottom and I'm going to scrub the sides and the bottom of the tank on the inside as well so that uh, any biofilm or anything that's left is stripped away. Now in a normal aquarium you want all that stuff so in, in a normal aquarium where I have a bioactive aquarium and I have filters and all that. I only scrubble the <laughs> scrubble. I scrubble. <laughs> uh, uh, I only scrub the algae and biofilm and stuff off the front panel of glass because I want as much of that in the aquarium as possible to help with converting uh, ammonia and nitrite. So this is different though in these tanks. So it's it's all about making them as sterile as possible because I don't have any way to combat anything that's going to decompose in there besides water changes. And I want to keep my water changes to a minimum so the meds I'm going to put in there uh, don't get diluted. So that's where we're at. All right, here we go. Let's scrub down some aquariums. All right, so here's the time lapse of just me scrubbing the tanks out. What I'm doing here is getting any biofilm or any organic matter that's settled on the sides or the bottom of the tanks off. So I just use like a green scrubby pad, nothing too fancy. These are glass, so I don't have to worry about scratching them like I would if they were acrylic. All right, so the tanks are all scrubbed down so I don't have biological stuff in there rotting and creating ammonia while the fish are in there. Now I'm going to drain them all to get all that dirty water out, get all the any residual hydrogen peroxide out, and um, yeah, so draining them, then I'll fill them back up. Probably won't show you that because it's going to be kind of boring, that'll take hours. <laughs> and uh, after that, I'll show you what we do from there. Okay, catch you in just a second. And we're back. Okay, so let me show you what we're doing here. We've drained all these. We have um, cleaned them all out. And you can see just how scratched up and messed up these are. These these old 30-gallon uh, breeders are, I don't know, they're super old and they came from a wholesaler. So they had some really hard use. And the wholesaler was in a part of the country that had super hard, massive amounts of calcium in the water. So it kind of just, frosted the glass with all the scratches that then got calcium embedded in those scratches and it's just impossible to get off but so they're drained out and as you can see they're filling um, so I don't know if you can see that little nozzle back there maybe it's easier against the block yeah there you go 
It's that little nozzle there. It's putting water into the tank. That's the auto water changer, and I just set it up to run for a little while to fill all these. So they're all filling now. Um, and as soon as that's done, then we'll just let them sit and bubble for a little bit. That'll gas off any uh, nitrogen and things like that that have been absorbed into the water from the airline. Uh, from the, I'm sorry, the airline, the water line, because the water gets real compressed before it comes into the house and absorbs all kinds of stuff. Um, and then after that, we'll just let it go for a bit. And then, uh, let's see here, on Sunday, the day before the fish arrive, I'll put salt in there so that it's all dissolved and waiting for the fish when they arrive on Monday. So that'll be the next thing I show you. Until then, uh, have a good one, but we'll be right back your time in about half a second, so see you then. I ordered 12 species, I got four. <laughs> That's uh, kind of the gamble you play when you bring fish in. You never know for sure what your fill rate's gonna be. Sometimes it's uh, very high, sometimes it's very low. And so this time I got in four species, and one of them is not actually the species I ordered. I ordered a Pseudomilgill um, signifer, um, and what I got instead was Melanotaniata, or Melanotania, sorry, Melanotania sungurer, which is a great fish, and I'm thrilled to have it, but I thought I was gonna have like 200 little pseudomugils instead I've got 17 large Melanotania sungurers. So, if I'm even saying that right, I haven't done a lot of research yet because I wasn't expecting that fish. But I will say it's a gorgeous fish and it's one I've been uh, wanting to get for a long time. It's just they're always so expensive, but uh, whatever, I got them now. So, now what I'd like to do is show you what I do uh, to kind of land the fish. So, you saw me clean all these aquariums before I left to the airport to pick up all the fish, and I was kind of in a rush so I didn't film it, but I put in two cups per 30 gallons of this stuff. It's solar salt. Um, there's a lot of debate you'll see online about what salt can I use? Can I use table salt? Does it have to be non-iodized? Can I use blah, 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 blah? As long as it's sodium chloride, I've never had a problem. I picked this stuff up at Home Depot. This is a 40 pound bag. It cost me five bucks. It's made for water softeners, and it's worked great for many, many years, and many large companies I know um, that I've worked at use the same kind of salt. So it doesn't really matter. You don't have to spend a ton of money getting something labeled aquarium salt. As long as you know it's sodium chloride, you can use it. And with this particular kind of salt, I've weighed it out, um, and two cups in 30 gallons, equals approximately five grams per liter. And that's the dosage I'm going for, is five grams per liter. And I say that because the salt you're using might be a different concentration. If you're not using big rock salt like this, um, and you're using fine table salt or something like that, then you might not need that much. You'll have to weigh it out and figure it out. So figure out what five grams per liter will be in your system, and that's the amount I use. So I use slightly less than two cups because even though they're 30 gallon aquariums, they aren't filled quite to the brim. There's a little bit of a gap uh, uh, below the top where the water ends. So that's been in there dissolving for the last, uh, when did I take off to the airport? Um, I don't know, 1231, something like that. Uh, and so that's in there now. So what I'm gonna do now is take uh, all these fish. Oh, look at that, bonus snail. I wonder what kind it is. Hopefully it's not an illegal kind. And um, I'm gonna do the typical, some people call it plop and drop, I call it temp and tank, but I'm gonna float these bags in the tanks and let the temperature kind of acclimatize because they don't seem to be particularly stressed, so I think we'll be fine doing that. So here we go. Let's get a little time lapse going here and get the bags floating in the, in the tanks to get the temperature acclimated. Sorry, the water change is going because putting those bags in the tanks has, you know, made the, the water overflow a bit and so it's, it's draining off. Uh, by the way, you probably, you might not have seen the unboxing yet, so what came in was uh, Spotted Head Standards, which is a really cool kerosin. Um, Monotania, is it Sun Guru? I, I'd have to look. Uh, I, again, I just briefly glanced at the invoice and saw what it was. Some wild angelfish. So these are wild angelfish, they're from Peru. 
and what was the last one? Um, oh yeah, stiff it on gobies, gold spot stiff it on gobies. So that's what I'm floating now. I put the stiff it ons in the middle tank because they like it a little cooler, so I didn't put them in the top. I put the rainbows and the angels in the top and the heads, uh, spotted head standards and stiff it ons I'm putting in the middle row because it's just a little cooler. So we'll let those float and get temperature let the temperature you know equalize. Now something that's really important that I need to do now before I forget is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take this valve and I'm going to shut it off and that will prevent new water from flowing into the quarantine tanks because I don't want the water flowing in tonight and diluting the meds. Tomorrow night I want it to flow in and dilute so I can put in more meds um, I, I dose every 48 hours with the meds I'm using. But tonight I don't want it to do that, so I want the fish to get in there and soak in the meds overnight until tomorrow night and they'll get a, they'll get a water change and then the following day I'll go ahead and redose. So here's the meds I'm going to use. I'm going to use a combination of furin 2, which is a nitrofurazone medicine, and I'm going to use uh, that in conjunction with canamycin. Now this canamycin you can get uh, off eBay. I think Rift Lake Aquatics is the one that sells it. I have, I'm not sponsored to say that. I have no stake in that company or anything. It's just where I found it the cheapest. This much, 100 grams, is 70 bucks, 75 bucks. So it's not cheap, but it works really well. The reason I use canamycin is because it treats gram negative bacteria. So does nitrofurazone. And in my experience, the two diseases I'm most likely to get from are columnaris and eremonis. And those are both those bacteria are gram negative. So that's what I'm treating for. Canamycin's fantastic because it absorbs through the skin of the fish and gets into the insides of the fish. So if the fish has an internal infection of any gram, well, I don't know about any, but of gram negative uh, bacteria, especially the common ones, columnaris and eremonis, then it'll absorb the canamycin through its skin. One of the big problems we have in fish medicine is that fish don't drink. So we dose the water column, but a lot of what's in the water column is, is maybe treating what's on the outside of the fish, but not necessarily getting inside the fish because freshwater fish don't drink to hydrate. They absorb plenty of water through osmotic pressure uh, just by existing in fresh water. Nitrofurazone doesn't necessarily absorb through the skin as, as readily, but in combination with the canamycin, it'll, it's, it's very well, it does a very good job of treating columnaris and uh, eremonis. So that's why I use those two. So generally, it's just those two in salt for three treatments every 48 hours. So that takes us to about six days, right, of treatment with those antibiotics. During that time, I'm not going to feed, or if the fish is very skinny, then I might feed very sparingly. Or if the fish is super skinny, like sometimes the little bararis, little pygmy rasboras and things come in, then maybe I won't treat with these antibiotics and I'll put in a sponge filter that's all cycled and the salt and I'll just feed them heavily because what they need then is food more than antibiotics. So maybe I'll fatten them up before I treat them. It, it just depends on the shape of the fish when they come in. From what I saw all these fish when they came in, it looks like everyone's kind of fat and doing fine, so I'm going to go ahead and treat with these antibiotics. Unless when I let them out of the bag and can really observe them, it's, it's kind of hard to see them through the bag, but I'm going to let them out of the bag and observe them, and if I see something else, then I won't treat with these medicines, maybe you'll do something else. For example, if a fish comes in with ick, then I don't treat with these medicines because I don't know if I can use them in conjunction with ick medicines. So what I do instead is I treat with triple sulfa, which is a, a good broad spectrum, a gram negative antibiotic, but maybe not necessarily as strong. But I know that it can be used in conjunction with ickx. So I'll use that and ickx together if they come in with obvious ick. If they come in with velvet, then I use copper and salt. So it kind of depends on what I see. But in general, when fish come in and I don't see any obvious external parasites or anything like that, it's canmycin and nitrofurazone that I use. So um, we'll come back in a minute once these guys are temp acclimated and we'll get them in their tanks and we'll add the medicines. 
Okay, we're back. The fish are temperature acclimated. I have four different species, so I've got four different nets, so I don't cross-contaminate. And I want to talk to you about nets a little bit. What you want to avoid is big, coarse-grained nets. What you want is something very fine like this. This is basically a massive brine shrimp net. It's soft. It won't hurt the fish. Um, it's not likely that their fins will get caught in this or anything like that. So it's really nice to use something like that. Here's another alternative. This is blue, but it's still a very, very fine, fine mesh net. So that's what I like to use with these fish. I don't want to scrape them up. I don't want to get any of their fins caught. If they're loaches, I don't want their little eye suborbital spines caught. If they're catfish, I don't want their spines caught. In fact, for a lot of catfish, I'll use a plastic sieve instead of a net. But just be careful what net you're using. Basically, we're trying to <laughs> keep them from getting injured or anything at this time as much as possible. I and mean, whatever happened before I got them, I can't control that. But now I have them, so now I'm gonna treat them as gently as I can and try to make sure nothing gets caught or torn or hurt. And when you're dumping a big batch of fish into a net, which is how you have to get them out of these bags, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So the softer the net, the better for making it as smooth a, an experience as possible for them. So here we go. Um, hopefully you can still see this. Yeah, you can see the bucket. Okay, so what are these? These are our spotted head standers. So what I'm going to do is just take this big bag of spotted head standers. I'm gonna cut it right under the rubber band or the middle clasp or whatever they have. Take this, pinch the bottom, be careful not to pinch a fish. Put it down in the net and just let it go. Now you triple check to make sure nothing's in the bag because a lot of these little fish will get stuck in the bag. Okay, that's clear. So now I've got this net full of head standers and I'm just gonna put them in there. There you go, guys. So that's pretty much it. Um, let's take a quick look at these guys. Now, the front of this tank is horribly dirty, I apologize, but um, here they are. <laughs> really neat fish. I love their head down behavior. Um, so anyway, I'm going to do this with the rest of the other fish that I have, let them all out of the net in the same way, and uh, then we'll get to medicating, and I'll show you that. Let's get all the rest of the fish out of the bags. Okay, let me show you this. What I'm doing with these gobies is I'm letting them swim out of the net. So I put them all in the net, then I put the net in the water, and I'm going to let them decide when it's time to swim out of it. The reason is, first, I'm not in a big hurry. Like, they're fine in there. But the reason is, is this thing is full of little car carbon chips that they put in there. Um, I think you can see some at the bottom there. All these little carbon chips to help with shipping, to absorb, I don't know, whatever chemical they're worried about, to help keep the water clear. Um, and I don't want that to get in the tank. So I'm just going to leave the net in there, let the fish swim out, and uh, then I'll come back in a little bit and remove it. It's not going to hurt anything sitting there. So that's what's going on there with those uh, stiffed on gobies. That's why I set the net in there. Just a gentler way also to let them out, I think. All right, let's finish getting these fish out of the bags. Just the same thing over and over again. Cut, dump. So this is that carbon stuff I was telling you about. The rainbows, I'm able to just gently kind of coax them out of the net without getting the stuff all over the bottom of the tank. But that's the stuff that I just don't want that in my tanks. Not that it'll hurt anything, it's just kind of a pain to get out. I am making a huge mess here. Okay, here's the aftermath. <laughs> Nets on the floor, <laughs> bags on the floor, <laughs> all, all this mess. So I'm gonna clean that up and then I'll show you uh, medicating the fish. So here's what we look like, freshly out of the bag. I haven't put in the medicine yet or anything. I've just been kind of observing them to see 
if there's any signs of anything obvious that needs to be treated, any external parasites, any uh, severely pinched bellies, which often is a symptom of internal parasites, anything like that. And these guys actually look pretty clear. Um, gills are a little, like on this guy, gills are a little distended. Um, but that, oh here we are, this guy right here. But that often happens just because if there's ammonia in the bag while they're being shipped. So they can get some ammonia burn and irritation on their gills. So hopefully that's not gill flukes or anything, but we will eventually, after we take care of antibiotics, we'll eventually get to the parasite medicines. So if there are any gill flukes, we can take care of that. And that's really easy. You can treat it with dimelin, which is, it's not good for shrimp or anything with, um, uh, yeah, with an exoskeleton more or less, but it's great for, uh, for gill flukes, so, and different kinds of flukes. And, and it's very mild on fish. That's an excellent medicine. Um, here are the Stiphodon gobies. First glance, they look skinny, which I expect with this species, unfortunately. They don't get fed very well with the wholesaler. Skinny, but they don't, the fins are clear, eyes are clear. I don't see anything, like see how skinny this guy is? Um, but again, looks like it's probably just a matter of fattening up that they're gonna need, which I expect when I get new fish in, unfortunately, because of, you know, what they go through. So, all right, these look excellent. I'm thrilled with these wild angelfish. They've come in just looking fantastic. And I think they're Peru, they might be Colombia. I'll have to look it up, I can't remember now that I think about it. Earlier I said Peru, it's Peru or Colombia. I can't remember their location, but man, this is gonna be nice. Some of our domestic strains have gotten so messed up that every now and then it's nice to bring in some pure blood <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to get back in the line, right? To kind of straighten things out. Or just keep them in their own right. I mean, that's just a beautiful fish. That's a good natural looking angelfish. So, pretty excited about them. And no, no real signs of uh, anything bad going on there. It looks like, you know, more expensive fish like this, um, they often get a little better care in it while they're being transshipped and exported and all that. Um, and then the sun gear. Now these guys frighten me a little bit. I'll see how they settle in, but there's a little puffiness to them, which means they were either fed like super, super good, or they could have an internal bacterial infection um, or, or something else that's causing their stomachs to be so puffy. It's not like, dropsy or anything, but, um, and maybe it's just because they were taken care of super, super well, but I don't usually expect that. Also, the fins are a little rough on some of these, like if you look, the finnage is a little rough on that one, on some of the others, um, but we'll see, hopefully, hopefully they'll, they'll be fine. It's, it's hard to tell sometimes, like that one, there's some, some roughness on the finnage, some white on the edges, like, like they've had some pretty bad ammonia in the past or something like that, I don't know. But anyway, I don't see any obvious external parasites on anybody or anything like that. I don't think, I mean there's something on this guy's dorsal fin, but um, I, I can't tell if it's like just a little damaged piece of fin sticking up or if it's some kind of uh, actual parasite on them, but I don't see ick or anything that's obviously gonna like take over externally real quick like ick or velvet would. So I'm going to start antibiotics on these guys instead of anything else. So it looks like um, it looks like everyone's going to get the canamycin and nitrofurazone or furin two combination. I, d I don't see anything that would tell me no. I should skip to something else. So I'll start with that. And uh, what I do is in a 30-gallon tank like this with the canamycin, it's two teaspoons. And the nitrofurazone is two and a half teaspoons 
for these size tanks with the products I'm using. That's how I get the right dosage. Um, and there's kind of a wide dosage point on those medicines, and I go for kind of the upper limit of the dosage. Not, not the highest limit, but a little higher. I don't want to go for the lowest one. So, um, looks like lights have switched off on me, so I'll go turn those on and then show you um, the lots of medicine. All right, so this might be overkill, but for these particular medicines, I don't want to breathe them in or absorb them through my skin. So I do wear a mask when I'm using these. I also use gloves on the hand I'm going to stick in the medicine container. And when I'm done using them, I wash my hands really good. When you open these medicines, or even like um, triple sulfa or uh, general cure, it's, they're really, really fine powder. And that stuff will get released into the air. And uh, it's not something I want to be breathing. So in the past, I haven't shown this just because it looks kind of silly. So when I've made videos in the past, I haven't <laughs> done this. But because, uh, you know, it's just it's silly. It's like mad scientist going on, right? Um, but then I figured, well, let me show you how I actually do it. And you know what? It's probably good to show this. Uh, I don't know how healthy it is for us to be running around using really fine medicines, getting them in the air, and then breathing them. Um, most people don't <laughs> use them frequently enough to have any effect probably, but since I use them pretty much daily or every other day, depending on how often I'm bringing fish in, um, I do this because I don't want constant exposure to them. So yeah, it looks weird, but I like a little protection, right? So canmyosin. Uh, this one's almost out. It's a really fine powder. Very water soluble. Um, very, very water soluble. So here's one teaspoon. And I think I've got like half a teaspoon left. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? So I'm just going to take this one, shake it into here. There was no way I was going to get that little bit out, so I shook it into here. And don't worry about expiration dates. Uh, these have the same expiration date. Uh, that bottle's only been open for uh, like a couple weeks, so it's it's fine to mix it in. If they were vastly dis different expiration dates, I wouldn't have done that. Anyway, that's one. Here's two. I kind of sprinkle it over so it can dissipate quicker. And here's the furin too. It'll definitely dye your water like a yellow greenish color. And by the way, I would use canamycin if from API if I could find it in like a large bulk powder. If anyone knows of one that they make, let me know. But so far I haven't been able to find that. So that's one. I really like API though just because uh, to make measuring and solubility and stuff really easy. Two and a half. So, so that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to go do the rest of the tanks now. So that's the first step for getting these fish in. So I'm going to do this. Today's Monday, I'll do it again on Wednesday, and I'll do it again on Friday. And then on probably end of the day Saturday, or perhaps Sunday, I'll move these fish to a more permanent home. So that's kind of the cycle I, I use as far as medicating. Once they're in their more permanent home, then I'll start using parasite medicine. So the first is general cure. I really like that. The mix of metronidazole and praziquantanol. Uh, ben, or quantal, or however you say it. Prazi and metro. Um, been very effective for many, many, many years. So I'll use that. I'll use ICX with that. If I see any evidence of external parasites. Um, sometimes I just don't worry about it if the fish has been that long and nothing's broken out. Um, and then I'll use, after that's done, then I'll do a levamisole treatment. And I'll show you guys that when we get to that point. 
All right, so it's Tuesday now, the day after these fish arrive. So let's take a look and see how they're doing. So they came in yesterday, and um, these are the spotted head standers. Again, sorry about the these old, old aquariums are just so frosted, the glasses. Even if I clean it, they're so scratched and stuff that it's just hard to get a really nice, clear <laughs> uh, shot. But these are all doing great. I have not pulled any bodies because there haven't been any. I think we're looking at 100% survival, at least so far on these guys. So, um, you know, I'll keep observing them, but so far so good. I just think they're such a cool fish. Up here, the rainbows, I'm, um, you know, they're doing fine. No one's died, no losses. A little bit of white on the mouth of some of these, that's very common with rainbows because they're such fast swimmers that in the, uh, you know, transport process and holding process and transshipment or wholesalers or exporters, containers and things, they'll sometimes uh, swim and, and bang their lips. So um, I, that's expected, and the meds will help take care of that. So, so far so good. No one seems to be overly bloated, which is nice. I was worried yesterday because they just seemed, I don't know if it was bloated or what, but um, yeah, they, they seemed a little too round in the belly which set off alarms in my head because sometimes when that happens that's a bacterial infection or something that's puffing up their insides and uh, but so far that hasn't increased so maybe we're fine I hope we're fine no bodies no deaths on these guys next we'll come down here these are the stifidon gobies and they're all I put these pots in here and I put an extra air stone in here too because these are like a hill stream type fish that needs you know, quite a lot of saturated oxygen in their water. These guys are all fine. I haven't seen any bodies here, so everyone's surviving and uh, so far doing okay. They're kind of colored up a little bit. It's going to take a little bit of feeding and stuff once they're through medicine to get them fattened up and, and you know, ready. But they seem to be doing just fine, so, so that's nice. And then here are the wild angelfish and no deaths here either. So, so far 100% survival rate from this shipment, which is fantastic. I mean, how could you have better than that, right? So, we're doing fine. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to treat these guys. Today's Tuesday. I turned on the auto water change system for this uh, rack a couple minutes ago. So tonight, it will change the water and this is how much water it changes. It runs for about half an hour, and this is the amount of water. It's, it's almost 50% that it changes in a night, just slightly less than 50%. Although with the water not being all the way to the top, and that there, it's, I mean, it's really darn close. So they'll get a almost 50% water change tonight, and, uh, and then tomorrow, I will do another round of the canamycin and nitrofurazone. I'll let that sit Thursday, and then Friday I will put in um, another round. So Saturday, or perhaps Sunday, but probably Friday, uh, Saturday evening, just because I have to get the tanks all cleared out for the next shipment. Um, I will go ahead and as long as everyone's in good shape, I'll move them to their more permanent homes, which are the 75 gallon aquariums. That for those that might be unfamiliar with the fish room, are, are the main body of the fish room. All these 75 gallon aquariums is where they'll be moved to. Okay, it's Wednesday morning and I'm about to redose these fish with the canamycin and the nitrofurazone. But before I do, I, I thought it'd be good to show you this, which is I'm going to test the water and see if there's any ammonia. Again, these are just pretty much sterile tanks. There's no, they're not bioactive. There's no nitrifying bacteria. And so I just want to test and see if there's any ammonia spiking in these tanks before I redose. Because it doesn't do any good to medicate fish if they're in an ammonia bath. They're, they're not going to improve. So I have to make sure the water's good before anything. So that's what I'm going to test today. And um, if there is ammonia, then I'll take the fish from that tank, put them in a new tank, 
that's uh, you know fresh and has nothing in it and then I'll medicate them there. So I don't want to treat and then test and find out, oh, this is full of ammonia, I have to move the fish, because then I'll just have wasted the medicine. So here we go. Okay, and we're good. This is the headstanders, and this is the um, rainbows. And as you can see, we're in pretty good shape. Although the head standers, uh, there's maybe a tiny bit of ammonia in there, so I might actually move them. But the rainbows are fine. That's zero. Yeah, there's a little bit in with the head standers, and that can happen even if you're not feeding or anything, just because even though you scrub the tank and all that, um, the fish come in if they poop, that, you know, ammonia, or if, uh, I don't know, there's any, just any stuff that's biodegradable at all in the tank then you can get a little bit even though you're not feeding so I'm probably gonna move them before I treat them let's check the angelfish and the gobies now these truly do appear to be just fine there's they're yellow 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 no green showing there at all um, and you know here's what we're going for most of you probably know this but it's the top one we want yellow. We don't want green and we definitely don't want anything even close to blue. That would be really bad. So if you compare these, I don't know if this will show, but the one here, this is the head stander. The one here is the, I believe, angelfish. And this one is a lot more yellow. This one has a tinge of green. So I'm going to go ahead and move them um, into another tank before I treat them. And it's not a ton of green, but I don't want any ammonia in there at all. So, now I'm going to move those headstanders to a different aquarium, and then I'm going to treat everyone with round two of the canamycin and nitrofurazone. Okay, so it's time to move these folks to their more forever home, or more permanent home until I sell them anyway. Um, as you can see, everyone's doing fine. I'm happy to report there were zero losses in the shipment, except for three. I lost three of the headstanders when they were in this tank, and we had that little ammonia spike. Um, before I moved them into this tank. So since I moved them into here, there haven't been any ammonia issues. I check every day, sometimes twice a day. And everyone seems to be doing great. Everyone's bounced back from shipping. They're spunky little guys. So I'm gonna move them to a 75 gallon that's a little more permanent setup so I can start feeding them and we can get some weight up on them. So these are the spotted head standers doing great. Up here are the Sunguru rainbows, if I'm saying that right. Um, Milana Taniata, I always do that, Milana Taniata, Milana Tania Sungur. And um, yeah, I, there's, there's still a couple, I mean, they're pretty much healed up. The fins are a lot clearer and stuff, but I'm definitely going to do some external parasite meds on these just because there's some little bumps on them and stuff that I want to take care of. So that's the next step, but they're ready to move to their next. Uh, tank so they can get fed. These guys have been rock solid. These are the gobies, Stephadon gobies, Stephadon, I think these are Ornatus, and they're just cute as a button. Not a problem with them whatsoever. So these are moving out. And the angels, same thing, no losses at all. So uh, these are about to move out to these wild angelfish. So that's what I'm going to do right now, get these guys uh, into their new aquariums. All right, well, since this video is already, you know, 40 minutes plus in length, I think we'll do the parasite treatment. So kind of the second week of getting them treated and fattened up uh, another day. So we'll call this the first part. So this is getting the quarantine tanks ready, getting everyone uh, in them and released, and then putting in the antibiotics and how I kind of manage that. Now that they're moved to the 75 gallon tanks, I'm gonna start the anti-parasite medicines while I uh, give them a lot of food frequently to help fatten them up and recover from all of this. So I'll show you that in a future video. Until then, if you have a question or comment, please leave it below, I'm, I'm happy to respond and get a discussion going with you. If you like this super long video, but I didn't want to leave anything out, right? But anyway, if you like this kind of stuff, if you'd leave a like, a um, share, 
a notification bell, click or subscribe, that would all be greatly appreciated. And until next time, I hope you have a great one. Bye-bye. Um,